Hey everybody, um, welcome to our maintainer track talk in 2024 in Salt Lake City uh, for Backstage. Um, how to build, how to expand your IDP, sorry, we just talked about the title of this talk. <laughs> uh, the new building blocks of Backstage. Um, let's start with some introductions. Um, so my name is Ben, I am a senior engineer at Spotify and also a core maintainer of Backstage. And I have with me Patrick. Hello, my name is Patrick, also an engineer at Spotify and core maintainer of Backstage. Cool, so before we kick off, uh, let's have a quick check of the agenda for today. So we're gonna start off with some project updates and then onto a quick fire round of changes and updates that have been shipped or coming your way uh, from over the last six months. Uh, and then the main topic or meat of today's talk uh, is about builder experience or more specifically builder experience uh, or plugin builder experience from a front end and back end perspective. I will also mention that uh, if you don't already know what Backstage is, then maybe this talk is not gonna be the best introduction. Um, so if you're watching this on recording, you might wanna check out a different talk first, maybe the one in Detroit with me and Francesco. It's a little bit more higher level. Uh, and if you're in this, this room and you don't know what Backstage is, we are in the Project Pavilion like in the afternoon times for the next few days, so please come and see us. We'll be there and we can talk a little bit more. Uh, right, with that said, let's uh, head into project updates. So let's start with the new project, uh, documentation project area. So this is comprised of three experienced, experienced backstagers. That's a mouthful. Uh, Andre from Spotify, Aramis from DoorDash, and Peter from Vodafone Ziggo. Uh, the scope of this project area is pretty broad when it comes to documentation, um, but it's immediately focusing on improving the documentation on the microsite and ensuring a quality onboarding experience for both new and existing adopters. I also want to shout out to the CNCF for getting us a docs audit too, which has really helped us get a good understanding of some of the areas for improvement uh, that this project area is going to be looking at. Uh, and there's a new SIG on the lock, uh, which is actually uh, the catalog SIG and adoption SIG kind of condensed into a more general one called the framework SIG. Uh, this is a great place if you're interested in the backstage direction from a high level, uh, but also really getting into the nitty gritty of more technical discussions too around backstage enhancement proposals um, and diving into some pull requests too with other backstage maintainers. Uh, and the community plugins initiative is also going great. Um, some of you might remember that we announced in Detroit that we would be uh, working on migrating some of these plugins um, from the core monorepo uh, into their own repository. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I a bit of water in my mouth is really dry. <laughs> Uh, where was I, sorry. Um, yeah, we're moving plugins from the main mono repo into a community plugins uh, repo, which has kind of got processes and foundations in place for helping uh, community uh, plugin builders uh, around publishing and change sets and API reports, rather than having to manage that all that themselves. So we're at 134 plugins across 77 workspaces, uh, which is great to see, and this number is ever increasing. Uh, special shout out to the community plugin maintainers here. Um, as well as Red Hat for helping us support this project area. All right, strap in. Uh, we're now going to continue with a couple of quick fire updates from around the project. Uh, so starting off uh, for uh, updates for new adopters, uh, the base template for a backstage, pro backstage project has been switched to Yarn 4, uh, which is a nice upgrade over Yarn Classic. Uh, we've, of course, also switched over to the new backend system uh, to be the default for new projects. Um, and speaking of that, uh, the new backend system is now stable with 1.0 shipped in our September release. Uh, that also includes the new auth system that we talked about uh, in the previous KubeCon uh, back in Paris. Uh, the old backend system as well is fully deprecated. Uh, we've loosely scheduled uh, to drop support for it in core features uh, by the end of this year. If you have not yet migrated to the new backend system uh, because you're blocked in any way, please open an issue on GitHub uh, so that we can ensure that everyone is able to adopt the new system. We've also done another security audit uh, very recently. So the scope was similar to the last one, uh, but we've now covered some new pieces, of course, like the new auth system. Uh, there were, of course, some findings. Uh, all have been fixed since the 1.31 release, uh, and advisors have been sent out as well. Now, one thing that's clear is that the previous audit uh, really helped strengthen our security posture. Um, it's reflected in the result of this new audit. Uh, still, this audit helped find some new uh, areas for improvement uh, to help us improve even further. And a big thank you to the CNCF for sponsoring this audit as well. And we've got a built-in event bus. Uh, so it used to be that if you scaled uh, the backend to be de uh, deployed across multiple instances, uh, you wouldn't have events distributed across all of those instances uh, by default. 
Uh, it's kind of worked all right for uh, receiving webhooks for catalog updates because they were distributed already, but it really hurt the ability to use the event system for anything else. Uh, so the event backend now has, has its own simple event bus uh, backed by the usual Postgres database that we use, uh, ensuring that all events reach all subscribers. Uh, it's an at most once delivery system uh, with a little bit of extra care taken to make sure that we don't drop events uh, with a graceful shutdown. Uh, but if you need higher guarantees, uh, we still recommend that you uh, plug in your own event broker. Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, scaffolder or software templates or self-service portal, whatever you like to call it. So we rolled out some changes recently in the UI um, that makes it a little easier to onboard to create new templates, as well as revisiting some of the documentation that you get in the scaffolder front end around the actions that are available uh, and even the field extensions for the form too. So form decorators. Um, so for anyone that's used the scaffolder before or written templates in the past, you might have needed to create uh, collect secrets from the user. So previously, you had to wrap up this collection in uh, this collection logic in a uh, field extension, which is basically like a React component that gets rendered in the form. Um, but that's not the case anymore. So starting in this release, which goes out next week, we're going to hold our fingers crossed that it gets out next week, um, which is that you'll be able to use these decorators, which are standalone bits of TypeScript that will run when the user clicks on the Create button right at the end of the form. So here you can take the opportunity to decorate the payload with additional secrets or even mutate the form data if you wanted to. Uh, this also has now the added benefit that the secrets get collected right at the end of the form, uh, which means that there's less risk that these secrets are going to expire um, by the time it takes for people to fill out the form. So there's a few things left to polish up here, but we are hoping for it will be released next week. <laughs> uh, and last but not least is retries. So we mentioned this at last year's KubeCon, saying the work was on the way. Uh, but now we can talk a little bit more about it and give a little demo. Uh, but firstly, what is it? So if you run the scaffold in production today and you have, you know, some longer running tasks, there's a slight chance that they might be subject to being killed or lost over like a redeployment or a restart of the containers that run the scaffold. So with the introduction of retries, it's going to allow us to pick that job back up and resume it from a previously known good state. Uh, it's also going to have the ability to let us retry failed steps, which is particularly useful if you have uh, upstreams that are kind of flaky. Uh, checkpoints in actions. Uh, are going to allow us to save non-good state across multiple runs, which helps us kind of make these actions more item potent. I'm really sorry, my mouth is so dry. I'm also coming off a cold, so I apologize if there's any disgusting noises over the microphone. <laughs> like that, sorry. <laughs> um, take, for example, creating a GitHub repository, right? So we know that we can't retry that action of creating a GitHub repository again because it's going to fail. So we instead wrap this up in a checkpoint so that we can keep that known good state and not have to redo that again when we retry. I also want to give out a massive shout to Bogdan from Ball.com uh, and the Scaffolder SIG for moving this forward. Um, yeah, big up them. They've done a great job here. Uh, but without further ado, let's dump in, uh, jump into a demo. And I'm really hoping this works. So, oops, that's really not what I wanted to do. Let me, uh, I've broken it already. Oh, does it not? Uh, there we go. Let me move that to the slides. There we go. Okay. So, um, here we have, I'm just going to start up the back end too and uh, jump to the template and show you what this is supposed to look like. This could get kind of interesting now. Okay. So, we have uh, backstage running here. Uh, I'm just going to jump into a, a template. So I've created a really flaky template that fails. Um, basically, for every, each step fails the first time it's run. You have to run it again for it to uh, succeed. So I'm just going to show you how that works today. Um, oops. Sorry. This is a good start, isn't it? OK. So we don't have any uh, uh, things to fill out in the form here. So I can just click on Create, and we see that it fails. OK. We have a little retry button here, so I can retry this. The action is going to wait a few seconds, pass, and then go to the next one. And then this fails. I'll retry it again. And you see exactly the same thing happens. This passes. This is now going to pass. And now we get to a failed one. That's how the demo is going to kind of work. So we see that we can retry. Um, but the thing is here is that it's always starting from the beginning again. But that's because we're not using checkpoints. So I'm just going to dive into the code here. 
so we can see the implementation for this action here. So we have a scaffolder module. We are registering this flaky action. And basically, if it's, not the, if it's the first run, it's going to throw an error, OK? Uh, I have this, oh, this checkpoint code here commented out. So I'm just going to introduce this. So what this is going to do is it's going to cache, um, sorry, now I can see it. It's going to cache the response from the actual function in the middle uh, and then yeah, basically not rerun that when we retry the action the next time. So like this could be, if you imagine, the GitHub create action inside here. Uh, let's just jump back to the code as I can. And then if I go to create, choose, and then click create again, we have the same thing. It fails first try. We retry. And then this is going to take two seconds. And then it's going to get to the next step. If I click on retry now, now it's kind of hard to see the first time, but for the last step, it's kind of a bit more obvious. But if I retry here, this will just skip the first step. And because uh, we already have the save state there, and we move on to the next one. If I click retry again, we'll notice how it kind of completes the first two steps automatically for us, and then moves on to the last one. So that's the simple demo of retries. I'm going to try and set this back up so that everything goes to the right place. Yes. And there we go. OK. All right, thank you. Uh, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about backstage plugins and uh, plugin builder experience. So first off, why do we even have a plugin system? So st starting at the top, our vision for backstage is to pr uh, for the backstage project is to power thousands of highly successful internal developer portals. So to start unpacking that a bit, uh, there are a couple of key characteristics of internal developer portals uh, that we've seen to be either true or desirable. So the goal is often to have a very large number of different features and integrations for your entire engineering organization. Uh, there's rapid iteration across these uh, features and creation of new features, and best case, also removal of obsolete features. The ownership of these features are distributed across many teams or individuals. And lastly, there's a moderate level of connectivity across the features. You can't really treat them as completely standalone applications, but they also don't need to be very closely integrated. Now, these characteristics, uh, I think, are key to why we ended up uh, with a plugin system as the foundation for Backstage when we first started building it at Spotify. Uh, but they also continue to guide us uh, in the ongoing evolution of the framework. Now, what do we really mean when we say plugin? Uh, so first off, these are general guidelines rather than restrictions, uh, but this is largely how we think about the plugin. So plugin is an isolated piece of functionality typically owned by a single team. Uh, it either implements its own standalone feature or is an integration with an existing service. And more concretely, uh, what implements this feature is an exist, uh, as a collection of extensions uh, for the front end that provide content or logic for different parts of the application. So that is to say that the primary component of a plugin is its front end with it, its extensions. But you can also add more things. Uh, a plugin can also have its own backend. Uh, it can have different libraries or extension points for other uh, plugins to use. So where do all of these plugins come from? Uh, we have a handful of them provided by the, uh, as core features in the Backstage project itself. Uh, there's hundreds in the ecosystem of third-party plugins where you can find things uh, from the open source community, especially in the community plugins repo that Ben talked about earlier. Uh, but you also have plugins from service providers and some commercial offerings too. Uh, but what I really want to highlight today is the ability to build your own plugins. Building your own plugins allows you to tailor the features to your own organization and encode your own best practices. They're often built by platform teams that are responsible for that associated uh, piece of infrastructure, but they can really be uh, contributed by anyone in your, or in your organization as well. Now, there are a couple of reasons uh, you might want to build your own plugins. Uh, you might, for example, be in a similar situation uh, to what we had at Spotify before Backstage, where you have a sprawl of custom tools uh, that your engineers have to navigate around. And, now, and then you want to centralize all of these tools into a single portal. Um, it might also be uh, that you're already set up and you're growing your internal developer portal, uh, but you're finding yourself limited by the built-in functionality, and you want to build new features that are more valuable and tailored to your organization. And more generally, uh, the value you get from building um, your own plugins is also a great way to drive adoption of Backstage. A fairly frequent mistake I've heard Backstage adopters do, 
uh, adopters do is to push really hard for adoption of the software catalog and populating the catalog, but then it falls a little bit flat because the entity pages aren't populated with any useful tools for the engineers. Custom plugins can really add a lot of value here quickly and they don't have to be a large investment. But regardless of the path you're taking, uh, if you're looking to build your own plugins, I want to highlight a few things uh, that we found to be important. So the first is distributed ownership is key if you want to keep growing. Uh, aim to have plugins owned, uh, plugin ownership lie within the team that it's responsible for each part of your engineering platform. A good strategy for that is to go out and really help these teams uh, build uh, plugins that get started directly. Um, also, be a bit careful with building too many toy projects. Uh, make sure that you really are solving problems for your engineers. And lastly, um, if you're building a plugin that integrates with an existing service, there are a couple of guidelines that we found to be useful. So, provide an at-the-glance view uh, for the most important data for your users. Expose one to three key actions, but for anything else, send users to the external service instead with a deep link. Don't go trying to re-implementing the entire service as a backstage plugin, it's just not worth it. Now let's shift over to looking at the goals that we have for building plugins with Backstage and ultimately making it a great foundation for your internal developer portal. Uh, we want to help build plugins that provide a consistent and cohesive experience for end users across the entire application. These plugins need to be maintainable by me being well isolated with clear communication boundaries and ownership. And we're also aiming for these plugins to be both customizable and extensible to make, it, uh, to make third party plugins more useful. Now, for builders that, that are looking to work on these plugins, uh, we want to provide a great developer experience uh, with our tooling and, uh, and also clear and intuitive APIs. Uh, to help uh, implement the actual functionality of the plugins, we're looking to provide libraries that help you solve common use cases in, in a portal. And really, as the foundation for all of this, a strong community around the Backstage project to help support and build things together. Okay. Uh, let's now have a look at what Patrick just said and how that applies uh, to what we're trying to build for the backstage front end system and let's dive in a little bit. So first off, the scope. So customization and theming, everybody wants to make the IDP their own. So this includes things like changing the colors and the styling and making it look like an, another internal tool perhaps, uh, but also being able to customize deeper, like changing the order of the cards on the entity pages. Extensibility, so we want to make it easier for adopters to bring their features and extensions to their own instance. So for example, their own catalog filters or their own field extensions, which I mentioned earlier, uh, for the scaffolder and be able to extend it to you know, fit their own needs. But as they say, with great power and all that, uh, we want to also make sure that we have strict and clear communication patterns for this extensibility. And then lastly, maintainability and isolation, which is kind of slightly related, but believe me when I say that Backstage can become very complex uh, if you've got a big instance. So plugins communicating in different ways across different frameworks becomes a maintenance nightmare. Uh, so we want to make sure that it's easy to manage at both a small scale and a large scale. Okay, so that's the experience that we're wanting to provide, uh, and our existing front-end system does a pretty decent job at this, at least in some areas. Uh, but for the past year, we've been working on a new system that really brings all this together and checks all the boxes. So our previous system relies or relied uh, pretty heavily on JSX and having to wire the app together yourself. So this was kind of really one of the main goals uh, of the old system is that the, the app kind of acts as a sitemap uh, so that you can easily see what's installed uh, and how it's structured. Uh, but this does lead to the need of having a little bit of understanding of React and needed to modify code in order to install plugins. So what we want from the new system is an easy way to install, configure, and manage plugins. So we're moving away from using TypeScript to integrate plugins uh, and moving all of that wiring responsibility down into the plugins themselves, and then those plugins providing sensible defaults. So now the only thing you need to do is register the plugin in the app, and then you can use static configuration to customize how it's integrated. And we call this declarative integration. So you might have seen us or heard us uh, mention declarative integration before at previous talks in Amsterdam and Chicago and Paris, and this is just one of the new features uh, for the new front-end system. Uh, over the next two slides, uh, there's two more features that I also want to talk about in the new front-end system. So blueprints. Uh, blueprints are really extension templates, uh, but we use the name blueprint as it's short and unique. Uh, sorry. 
um, the author of a blueprint is able to encapsulate the creation of a new extension behind a few parameters, while the plugin authors are able to use these parameters to create extensions themselves. So as an author of a blueprint, I can predefine where the extension is attached in the app, along with the default implementation and a base configuration for the extension. Here you can see an example of using the page blueprint to make an extension which represents the scaffolder page. This is from the plugin author's perspective of using these predefined uh, parameters to configure this page extension. So we pass through the params object, as you can see, uh, with a root ref and a default path and a loader, which is basically saying, how do we render this page? So there's many examples of blueprints. I'm going to come on to two more shortly. Um, but yes, page, uh, page blueprint is just one of them. So moving on to overrides. So overriding was a pretty big feature that we wanted to bring closer to the framework uh, and allow the ability to override extensions at a code level much easier. So say, for instance, you wanted to change the contents of a particular code in a plugin with your own. You can do that much more simply now. Changing the path that something is mounted on, as you can see in this example, it's a little bit easier now. I also wanted to call out, especially in this example, how it's easy to override extensions that are provided from a plugin that maybe you don't own. So in this case, the catalog plugin, we're overriding this page catalog extension with our own. Sorry, I had to double check the slide. OK, let's jump into a demo, another demo. Uh, oops, here we go. Some notes there for you all. OK, uh, let's jump into this. So how do I hide this ports thing? There we go. Um, OK, so let's create a new uh, front-end plugin. So this is the same example we had earlier. Uh, oops, why is it dictating all my? <laughs> no. I have no idea how to turn this off either. No. <laughs> Fixed it. There we go. <laughs> that would be so much easier. <laughs> Just do the demo. You're new. <laughs> OK, uh, so we're going to run your new here. We're going to create a uh, new front-end plugin. Uh, we're going to call this KubeCon. Uh, here we go. So hopefully your install is going to work. The Wi-Fi is kind of flaky here, but we'll get past it. OK. So that's created as a new uh, front-end plugin. And I can see that if I uh, just jump to the plugins folder, I can see I have this new KubeCon folder here. And it's, everything is self-contained inside this one folder. So if you're familiar with Backstage today, you'll know that uh, when we create a plugin, we have to wire this up ourselves, right? So <coughs> Excuse me. If we go into the uh, packages folder, into the app, normally this app.tsx is, depending on how big Backstage is for you, could be huge. You're just adding a lot of plugins in there. And it got, now gets replaced with something like this. So us adding the package into the package JSON file means that it automatically gets detected and added into the app. So I'm just going to start the front end now. And hopefully, let's give it a second. Yes, we will see. Yes, so now we have a little sidebar item with our KubeCon uh, uh, item in there. I'm just going to go and show you that this is actually a real demo by going to change. Um, oops, changing the um, text of this KubeCon to let's do Salt Lake, save that, and then go back. Can we see that it says Salt Lake? That's good. Um, I want to explain a little bit what's inside this uh, file here, inside the plugin. So we can see that we have uh, a few extensions here uh, using the blueprint. So we're using a page blueprint to create the KubeCon page. We are using a nav item blueprint to create the nav item that gets rendered in the side. And then we wrap all this up in a front end plugin and give it some extensions. So I'm just going to uh, create a new extension and using a new blueprint that we have. Um, I'm just going to pop to the my service over here. And we can see that we have backstage running. And let's say if I want to add a new tab, I can do that by using the entity content blueprint. So I'm going to create a new entity content. And this is entity content.make. And then we go to our params. Oops, if I could type. And then we can give it a default path. We can say it's on KubeCon. I can give it a default title to. And we'll call this KubeCon2, why not? Then we need a loader. Uh, this is a little bit tricky, but we just, I've already got one pre made, which is nice. Components, entity content, and then we need to render this as a JSX element. M dot, this we go. Oops. 
There we go. OK, so saving this is not going to do much um, because we need to add it to the actual plugin. So we see at the bottom we have our extensions. I'm just going to go and add this new one in here, Entity Content. Save on that. And then if I go back, I can see we have a new tab here that's popped up with our example content too. Cool. So that's a little brief demo about how easy it is to now to wire extensions together in a plugin and setting up new plugins in the new front end system. Um, let's go back to this. Uh, back to the notes. There you go. Cool. Okay. Sorry, it's really tricky. <laughs> What's going on? Um, Okay, yes, uh, so let's take a peek at the roadmap for the new front-end system going forward. Uh, so our overarching goal is to have it be ready for adoption in backstage apps, uh, and there are a couple of initiatives that we're aiming for to get there. So first off, we're reaching to, uh, looking to reach feature parity with the existing front-end system for the base application. Uh, this includes improving things like the way we build the catalog entity pages and the sidebar. Uh, we're Sorry. <laughs> We're also continuing to uh, encourage plugin owners to add simultaneous support for the new front-end system uh, to their plugins, uh, both to gather feedback, but also for them to be ready um, to use in the new system. And lastly, uh, to validate the front-end system at scale, uh, there's no better place for us to try it out than our own internal backstage instance at Spotify. Uh, so we are just now starting up work to fully move over our own internal project uh, to the new front-end system. All right, uh, enough about the front-end system. Uh, let's have a quick look at what we're doing in the back-end space. So let me start by highlighting this. Uh, you are not required to use the backstage back-end system for your own plugins if it doesn't fit your needs. Uh, what you do instead is simply build your plugin front-end as usual and then call your existing back-end services directly. Uh, we are taking care to make sure that you're not locked into building back-ends uh, using our system. Now, for those of you that do want to use it, uh, we're aiming to provide a very lightweight microservices framework. Uh, we're going to, for a modular design that allows you to extend things uh, with new functionality, for example, installing scaffolder actions and catalog processors. And we've got a big em emphasis on providing service interfaces that you can rely on both as a plugin builder for your implementation, but also customize as an adopter of Backstage. Now, I want to dive a bit deeper into these service interfaces and how they help you build plugin backends. This is the current list uh, of services provided by the Backstage framework and the core features. Uh, you can see we've got solutions for things like database access, task scheduling, logging, and a bunch of other stuff. Now, all of these are defined as interfaces that you can depend on in your plugin. It's all wired together, uh, and it's all wired together with our lightweight dependency injection system. Now, something that's important for us uh, for the plugin builder experience is testing your plugins. And this is really a place where the service system shines. Uh, all of our core services provide different type of mock implementations that makes it much easier to write tests. We pr also provide ways to start up a test backend uh, that you can run your plugin in. Uh, and this test backend comes with built-in service mocks, which really makes it a breeze to create integration tests for your plugins. And by the way, uh, this is more built out in the backend system, but we're really aiming for the same patterns and utility um, through our utility API system in the front end as well uh, to get the same benefits there. All right, uh, so let's, now let's dive into a little demo of what this looks like in practice. There we go, I'm gonna stop this. Hey, there we go. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another package here. Uh, I'm gonna create a backend for our KubeCon plugin. Now, in Ben's demo, uh, the, the template he used for the front-end plugin, it's a demo template for this talk. Uh, this is actually the plugin template that you get nowadays out of the box uh, in a new Backstage project, if you're on the latest version. So I'm first gonna just show the plugin code real quick. Uh, this is the plugin that you get. We ex we're exporting the definition, we're creating a backend plugin. We're depending on a couple of different core services, and we're using these services to wire together a router that exposes a REST API. Um, and this plugin comes, uh, by the way, with this example implementation that you can kind of use to get started building a backend plugin, a plugin backend. All right, but what I really want to focus on is the test uh, for this plugin. So I'm going to head over to the plugin test. There we are. This is the second test. First off, I'm going to just run it to make sure it's all good. Uh, yarn test. There we go. And that they are, oh, that's, that is cramped. Okay, yeah, they're passing. We got two passing tests right there. Cool. Uh, so here we see the uh, test backend. 
uh, being started. Now, this uh, test tests an endpoint uh, that is calling out to the catalog backend. And rather than mocking these calls to the catalog backend at the HTTP level or running an actual catalog plugin to test towards, what we can do instead is import this catalog service mock that we get from the uh, catalog uh, node library. Uh, all we need to do is provide a set of entities that we want to exist in our catalog, and then it just mocks the rest of the catalog API for us. So now in this test, we start up the backend with our own plugin, this catalog service mock. We get the server back that we can then um, run requests towards to make sure that the endpoint works as expected. Um, and that's what we got here. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this test backend, it comes with built-in mock services. Uh, one of them is a mock for the auth uh, service. Uh, and the way it works in test by default is it just treats all requests as if they were authenticated as a user, just to avoid having to add uh, authentication to every single uh, request that you're making. But I can override this behavior if I want. Uh, so I can provide an authorization header. That's close. Uh, but what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to use mock credentials, or mock credentials object from the core um, test utilities. I'm going to provide a user, and then I'm going to explicitly provide a header that represents invalid user credentials. So if I update the test uh, to use this authorization instead, rerun it, we can see that the test is now failing with a 401 response, because we're no longer authenticated properly. All right, uh, that's it for the demo. Let's see, we want to do it in that direction. Yes, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so just roadmap for the backend system. Uh, the way forward uh, is, well, really, as mentioned earlier, we have shipped the 1.0 release, and our main focus is on the front-end system at this point. But there are a few things we're doing. Um, we want to just, in general, add more core services uh, for plugins to use. A more targeted thing that we're looking at, um, more particularly, is to uh, make it possible to customize the auth service so that you can provide your own service auth implementation, which might be useful if you're running things and already have that set up. And lastly, we're going to uh, look at how to better handle database migration, so especially making it see, uh, simpler to do rollbacks. And that was it for the backend system too. Just lastly, to wrap things up, I want to highlight a few other areas that we're looking at as well. So one of them is the backstage CLI and make it, making it more flexible, uh, like supporting more package managers, making it possible to bring your own templates for the new command, and really modular, modularizing the entire CLI so that uh, it has more of a plugin system of its own. Now, we are relying on the community for much of this to be contributed uh, to the CLI, but it is a priority for the maintainer team to help guide these contributions. And big thank you to everybody who's uh, been starting out helping uh, us with this so far. Now, an area that we're looking at ourselves in the maintainer team more directly is improving the performance of the catalog backend. Uh, so that's been going on for a little while now, actually. And finally, we've uh, just started an initiative to look at how we can improve the design system and libraries for Backstage. So keep an eye out for updates in that area. And that's it. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Uh, I think we have time for questions. Do I have time for questions? Anybody got any questions, anyway? <laughs> you can also catch us here afterwards. Yeah. Sure. One question. There's a microphone there if you want to go speak into it. So just curious, um, we got, if you're planning to move to React 19, I know some of our stuff with our designers want to start to use web components more than Material UI, um, and just having that native, uh, just easier to plug those in. I'm going to let you take this. Nothing specific. <laughs> we, yes, we're very aware of React 19. Looking at the area, nothing specific to share right now. But um, yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Any other questions? Don't be shy, but don't bite. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> No, great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.